Thank you so much for tuning in to my latest message, Assessing the Trump Prophecies. Before starting this message, I wanted to let you know that I will be doing several articles that will answer questions people have asked about the elections and the Trump prophecies. If you would like to receive an email with links to these articles, please sign up for our email list at email.radicalpursuit.net. Once again, that is email dot radical pursuit dot net. Just sign up there and we'll email you when those articles are released. So anyway, thank you for listening and I hope you enjoy the message. Okay, so go ahead if you have your Bibles and turn to uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 20 through 21. And what we're going to do today is we're going to really get into assessing the Trump prophecies. And if, uh, unless you've been in Fiji on a deserted island, you realize that 40 plus prophetic voices have said Donald Trump would be reelected. And obviously that has not happened. And there, there really is a lot of questions that people have. And I know just, I mean, just even seeing people's responses, we, our church, did, we did a survey for our church and just seeing the people's responses in the survey, I mean, there was confusion and questions, some sadness, just like, okay, what, how do I work through this and how do I make sense of all this? You know, just, just really overall uh, confusion in, in our church. And I'm sure it's that way in the body of Christ. And I really want to uh, spend this message trying to help people work through that. How, how are we to take the prophecies that were made by 40 plus prophetic voices. Again, someone, I read an article where someone said over 40 people uh, said Donald Trump would be reelected in a prophecy. I don't know who does the counting of those things. That sounds like a boring job, but someone obviously counted. I mean, it seems right to me. I mean, so many people have made a prophecy about Donald Trump. And, you know, I really want to just work through, okay, what happened? I mean, what really took place? I mean, I don't think I've, in my whole lifetime, I've ever witnessed something quite like this where so many prophetic voices, a lot of them very trusted, said something and it didn't happen. How are we to, what are we to make of that? And how are we to work through that? And how are we to process that? And, and there's a lot of processing to go on in that. And so anyway, in, in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 20, uh, through 21, Paul gave us what I believe would be the word of the Lord in this current situation we find ourselves in. And Paul said, do not despise prophetic utterance. Do not despise prophetic utterance. Wait, I, you know, I know a lot of people, have, I've, I've heard it, I've felt this way a little myself. I don't want to hear another dream. I don't want to hear another vision. I do not want to hear another prophecy. God forbid that today on Super Bowl Sunday there will be a Super Bowl prophecy. You know, it's like everyone's like, God, you know, just up to their neck in prophecies. And they're like, don't give me another dream, vision, or prophecy. I'm just, <laughs> I'm tired of that. And I get that. You know, some have even said, I just want to go back to the scriptures and not worry about what other prophetic voices are saying. I get that. I feel that way a little bit as my, myself. But Paul would tell us, he would say, don't despise prophetic utterance. Don't despise prophetic utterance. And even in the survey we did in our church, 12% um, of us said we don't pay very much attention to prophetic words. I'm sure they, you know, I'm kind of looking for the body language. She put that. You know, I see he's blushing or getting nervous when, when I say that. But 12% said in our survey, they don't pay much attention to prophetic words. And, and I would say, don't despise prophetic utterance. We need, we need the word of the Lord in this hour we live in. So do not despise prophetic utterance. In our survey, about 18% said they have become cynical now because of these failed Trump prophecies. I mean, that's, that's, I mean just in our... In our small church, that's a big deal. I'm sure if you get even a larger spectrum of the body of Christ, it's even bigger than that. So I believe Paul would counsel us. The first thing he would say is don't despise prophetic utterance. And I believe that is a correction to some of us who would just want to not do anything, want to have anything else to do with prophecy for a while. As, God, as, as the Paul would say, don't do that. Don't despise prophetic utterance. Now, here's the second part of what he said. 
And this is also a correction to some of us, myself included, but examine everything carefully, hold fast to that which is good. And if I was being honest with you, my, probably the, one of the mistakes that I made during this time was, you know, you, you got 40 plus, I, mean, I didn't know then there was 40 plus people, there's 40 plus people saying Trump's gonna be reelected. Re I'm like, certainly that many people can't be wrong. And I just kind of just accepted it as gospel that it would, Trump would be reelected. And I didn't properly vet and test the prophetic words. That was an error on my part. That was something I learned from this is, you know what? I need to do what the scriptures say and examine everything carefully. Hold fast to what's good, all right? So there is not one pro prophetic voice living that is infallible. And so that's why the scriptures tell us we have to test every prophetic word and hold fast to what's good. Amen? So, you know, I think God would probably correct some that would say, I'm going to despise prophetic utterance and become cynical. I don't want anything to do with it. And on the others, he would say, okay, you've learned a really good lesson here. You need to examine prophetic words carefully and closely and hold fast to what is good. Take it back to the Lord. Ask the Lord, okay, what do you say about this? What do you think? What do you feel, Lord? What are you saying? And then through that, you can, we can have a better understanding of uh, what the Lord is saying. And so, you know, as we get started, you obviously know this, but if anyone watches online, I just want you to know, I am absolutely 100% charismatic in my beliefs. I believe the gifts of the Spirit are for today. I believe the gifts of the Spirit should not only be believed in, but also practiced. And so, this, this message is not in any way a slam against prophetic ministry. This is, my heart is that in this, is the body of Christ would come out of this hearing God's voice in a much more accurate and much more clear way. That, that's really the heart I have. And I also come with this going, you know, with feeling the, 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 the burden of God's people in this, the confusion, the sadness, the cynicism, the lack of trust. You know, who do I trust? I mean, what pro prophetic voice can I trust? You know, just, just seeing that some of the response really has, uh, has burdened my heart is, uh, you know, th there is a, a seeming like lack of trust. There is a, a cynicism that's happened. There is this feeling of confusion and things like that. And my heart goes out to, to those people that feel that way. I really want to help the body of Christ work through this situation. So that's where I'm coming from. My prayer is that through this, the body of Christ and the church around the world, the prophetic ministry would come into its rightful place and because we need it in this hour we live in. Amen. In the end times, in this hour we live in, we need the voice of God more than ever before. The pure word of the Lord uh, more than ever before. So that's where I'm coming from in this message. So just want to give you some uh, insight into our survey result. The first question we asked our church is, what best describes your view of the 40 plus prophetic voices who said Donald Trump would be reelected? 21% 20, of you said they got it right, but the election was stolen. 6% said, just wait, God's about to do a miracle. 30% said the majority missed it and we have a real problem in the prophetic movement. And then 12% said, uh, I don't pay much attention to prophetic words. So that's interesting. The, the second question was, what best describes your view of the prophetic voices who gave an incorrect word about Trump's reelection? Uh, what should they do? 40% said if they missed it, they need to apologize. And I'm glad some have. 3% uh, three, three said prophets don't ever need to apologize. 18% uh, said they didn't miss it, just wait, God's about to do something. And then 6% uh, said, I don't pay attention to prophetic words. So that's kind of a different number than the other, but, but different other question. Anyway, number three, what best describes how the Trump prophecies affected you? And this, is where, this is where my heart goes out to, is 30% said it created some doubt and confusion toward prophetic ministry. And that, that's where... That's where my heart is, is to try to help people work through that doubt and that confusion. I think all of us, all of us, if we're being honest, have a little bit of confusion. I mean, this has been one of the most, well, not the most confusing time in my life. I mean, probably all of our lives between the, what happened in the election, what happened with these prophecies. I mean, all of us have 
some confusion we're working through. And that's where my heart goes out to. And then the other area is, is 12% said it really affected me, causing confusion, doubt, or mistrust. So we got about 42% of our church that felt like this event caused them to be a little more cynical, you know, some not so much, a little bit, others a lot more. And even seeing some of the responses, I could see the, the, the hurt that this has caused in, in, in the body of Christ. And so that's what we want to hopefully clarify. <clears throat> and then number four, after the Trump prophecies, what best describes your view of prophetic ministry now? Um, 39% said, I view it the same as before. 21% said it created some doubt, therefore I need to be better about testing going forward. And then 18% said I'm more cynical, uh, I'm more cynical towards prophetic ministry now. And so I just want to help us work through these issues. Um, the first thing we've got to understand is this, is the, in the New Testament, the difference between Old Testament prophecy and New Testament pro prophecy are vastly different, vastly different. Under the old covenant, if you prophesied and you prophesied incorrectly, you were stoned. You were killed. So, I mean, you got to imagine you're not going to just be flippant about, flippantly share a word. Oh, I had a dream, I had a vision, the Lord says this, is and this. I mean, your life literally was on the line if you missed it. Well, there was a reason for that is because God was working, God had released a sovereign grace in the Old Testament and even, in, even on the 12 for the new, in the New Testament, in the writing of scriptures, so that the, the vessels he chose would be infallible in what they said as they were writing scripture. So he released a certain grace on the Old Testament prophets that allowed them to be infallible. But if, they, if those who missed it, they were killed. Now that's not the standard under the New Covenant. That's not the standard the, under the New Covenant. Under the New Covenant, the standard is if a prophetic voice speaks and they miss it, you, it's up to you, it's up to the church to have the responsibility to test prophetic utterance. Make sense? It's a, it's a very different standard. So God's heart in this, God's heart in this as a loving father, the heart of God is he wants, just like Moses said, I wish everyone could prophesy. I wish every one of God's children could prophesy. God has, pour, has poured out his spirit upon all flesh so that your sons and your daughters will prophesy and you'll have dreams and you'll have visions. And so God wants to give the entire church a spirit of prophecy to prophesy. Now, obviously that opens up the, 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 a huge can of worms. I mean, that opens up a massive can of worms especially now that we have YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, where anyone and their brother can get a quote-unquote word from the Lord and post it up there, create a following. I mean, we got a tremendous mess right now in the charismatic movement. But I, I think God's heart is he, he loves the fact that his children can prophesy. But that's why we've got to have a, a prophetic accountability in the prophetic movement. Because if we don't have... Uh, correction, where we don't have accountability, we lose integrity of what we say. I mean, there's only so many words you can say the Lord said and you're wrong where you lose all credibility in what the Lord's speaking, right? So we've got to have accountability. We've got to have accountability in the prophetic movement. We've got to be able to, you know, I think the church has really failed in judging prophetic ministry. I think that's probably the one area in the charismatic church where we have failed. We have, we, we have been afraid to say, you know, brother, I love you, but that was not from the Lord. You know, that, you missed it, and you need to acknowledge you missed it, and we are testing that. That's where we in the charismatic movement have got to do a better job of testing prophecy like the scriptures say. Here's the other thing. We should never, ever, ever equate New Testament prophecies or prophets with the scriptures which are fire tested absolutely infallible proven over over thousands of years with modern day prophecy and prophets ever and i think in the charismatic movement some have done that 
Some have said, well, modern day apostles and modern day prophets are, are basically the equivalent of the scriptures. And I would say, absolutely not. God released a sovereign grace on the prophets in the Old Testament and a sovereign grace on the apostles in the New Testament so that what they would say and what they would write would be infallible so we could have the scriptures, God's holy word. He has not released that type of grace in modern day prophets and apostles. That is why even the, the most anointed, the most you know, revelatory, prophetic, with a great track record, whoever it is, whatever it is, no one is beyond the need for the body of Christ to test prophecy, all right? Because no new, modern day New Testament prophet is infallible, and that's why we have to test the prophecies. That's why we have to test Scripture. Make sense? The other thing I would say is not all prophecies and prophets are the same. And I, I've, been, I've said it, but a lot of people have said it, is the 40 plus prophetic voices have missed it. And I would say that's actually not a correct way to say it. A more correct way is if we're, we're going to be really honest, we've got to take every prophet and every prophecy spoken and test those individually to really see if it's true or not. We cannot just lump and that's what we do in this day and age. We just categorize everyone in this one category. The prophets missed it, the prophets missed it, the prophets missed it. And I would say that is wrong. Some prophets missed it, but if you actually look at some of the other words, some of them gave the, the conditions to me that, that showed there was a conditional prophecy. So to group everyone into one massive category and say the prophets missed it to me is wrong because there is a vast spectrum in the charismatic church of, uh, of prophetic ministry. Like, you know, for example, some who, who spoke about the Trump prophecies gave conditions. You know, Trump must uh, repent of his arrogance or tr Trump must repent of his uh, rhetoric, his uh, divisive rhetoric, or the, ch or the church must stop idolizing Trump if he's to be reelected. Or uh, Trump, it's God's heart for Trump to win, but the election can be stolen. And so those conditions to me uh, show that some of these prophecy, prophecies were conditional. Now, if someone said without condition before the election, Trump is going to win when there's no conditions, or Trump is going to be reelected, no conditions, or Trump's going to serve a second term, no conditions, then those prophecies were not correct. Uh, Lauren Sanford came up with the term rubber band prophecies, where people who miss it take the, the situation, they try to stretch the meaning. And they, you know, someone, for example, someone says, well, Trump won. And that was all they said. Trump's going to serve a second term as president. And that's all they said. And afterwards, they go, well, he did win, but it was stolen. Well, they were wrong because they didn't say that before. If you said it before, you're right. But if, yeah, I think. But if you, said it, if you didn't say it, then you were wrong. And you should acknowledge that you missed it. You know, some people are going, well, God, Trump is the spiritual president in heaven. Or Trump is the, you know, some have even said Trump is the president under, you know, I forget even what it was, under, I won't even go there, so I can't state it correctly. But Trump is the spiritual president. Or Trump is the president in heaven. Or, you know, just wait, you know, just wait. God's going to move and all that. Those need to acknowledge I missed it, in my opinion. If you did not put conditions on the prophetic word and, it, and, it, and, and you, beforehand, you cannot try to rubber, rubber band and fit your prophecy to make it work. So when we come to, when we come to uh, prophetic, the prophet, I'll just say the prophetic movement, there is a vast spectrum in the prophetic movement. And, and I'm just going to share with you how I look at the prophetic movement. And so I, I, these, these are my categories. <laughs> you may, it may be helpful to you. It may not be helpful to you. I don't know. But I, I, there's one category. There's the Elijah list prophets. All right. So there's the Elijah list prophets. If you follow the Elijah list, you would know some of the names in the Elijah list prophets. Uh, so, that, so those are one group. Of, of prophets. Um, there are also the New Apostolic Reformation prophets, and that would be people who believe in the seven mountain mandate 
and believe that uh, the, the, the church is going to transform the nations before Jesus comes back. That would be another category of prophets. Then you have the prosperity gospel prophets uh, that, that, who believe in the prosperity gospel. Some of those prophesied that Trump would be reelected. You have the televangelist prophets who were on TV, and some of those prophesied Trump would be reelected. Then you have the social media prophets who anyone out there gets on social media and posts whatever they feel like God is saying. So my point is this, is there is a vast spectrum in the prophetic movement, and to say, to ever equate every one of this one massive group is absolutely not the right thing to do. And, you know, especially, we've got to, we've got to, we've got to assess every prophetic word and every prophetic ministry individually if we're going to properly vet the prophecies that were given. And so what I'm going to do, there's no way I could go through all prophecies and prophets and this message, we would be here forever. What I'm going to do is just share with you nine characteristics that help me build trust. What I'm looking for is, is do I trust a prophetic minister? Can a prophetic minister, you know, if they meet these criteria for me, this for me gives me the ability to trust what they say. And, and I, that, you know, hopefully this helps you kind of see that. Um, the first thing is, number one, is do they have a secret place relationship with Jesus Christ? Do they have a secret place relationship with Jesus Christ? For me, that's the most important. Do they have a history in God? Are they, do, they spend, do they make the secret place of the Most High God their most important place way greater than prophetic ministry? Is that their number one thing? You know, the, the, said about the apostles is people looked at the apostles and said they could tell they had been with Jesus. You cannot fake uh, you cannot fake intimacy with God. You cannot fake it. You will know if a man or a woman of God truly is intimate with Jesus. And so that's what I look for. Do they have, do they prize intimacy with God above every single thing else that they would, they would do? So you cannot fake intimacy with Jesus Christ. The second thing I would look, I look for is do they proclaim the testimony of Jesus? Revelation 19.10 says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The highest form of prophetic ministry is to give declaration and proclamation of the revelation of Jesus Christ. That is what the ultimate goal of a prophet is. It is not to predict a Super Bowl. It is not to predict a president. It is not to predict an earthquake or whatever. That is so low level. The highest level of prophetic ministry is the testimony of Jesus Christ. And to me, if a prophetic minister does not carry the testimony of Jesus Christ, I don't trust what they say. I really don't. I don't. I don't pay much attention to what they say. If they don't carry the testimony of Jesus Christ, if they don't preach Jesus Christ and him crucified as their number one message and life, I don't put much attention or pay much attention to what they're saying because I, I just don't trust. That does not build trust with me because the scriptures say the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. You know, it, it's just, it's really, you know, just watching this, it's amazing to me. And I, I've even found this even on our limited YouTube channel, just watching some of the numbers. When you talk about topics like the election and America and what happened, the views go way up. But when you start talking about the simple gospel truths, the views go way down. I even saw that just even in our own church experiences. You know, when we would invite, you know, when Terry Bennett would come, and at first he was sharing encounters. But when, when Terry started preaching Jesus Christ and him crucified, I mean, the crowds just dwindled. And, and you know, that's it's really the truth. It's is you can build a, a powerful, you can build a very large platform today giving out prophecies. And, but once you start preaching Jesus Christ and him crucified, the crowd start to dwindle. And so we got to look for, are they preaching the testimony of Jesus Christ? Number three. This is a big one for me. Do they understand God's ultimate intention? Do they understand God's eternal purpose? Huge. Huge. Think about this. is when Paul wrote the book of Ephesians and he said, God has given to the church first apostles, then prophets, then teachers, pastors, 
and uh, evangelist, he did that in the context of a book, in a context of a book that was written about God's ultimate intention. Paul wrote the book of Ephesians to unveil God's ultimate purpose, God's ultimate intention, which was established beforehand before the foundation of the world in the eternal counsel of the, of the Godhead that God would establish an ultimate intention to have to, for Jesus Christ to be at the center of all things, for Christ to have a bride who has made herself ready, for the sons of God to come forth full of the Holy Spirit, conformed into his image, and for the Spirit of God to have a house and a temple and a body that he fully possesses. I look for in prophetic voices, I say, are the, are the prophetic voices speaking of God's ultimate intention? Because if they're not, I don't put a lot of trust in what they have to say. Because it's very low level prediction and prophecy. That is not to me something I, I put a lot of emphasis or trust in. Number four, they have correct eschatology. They have correct end time views of prophecy. And we've been going through a lot of that in our end time class. This is huge, huge. I am leery of any prophetic voice that believes in partial preterism. I am leery of any prophetic voice that believes in partial preterism, that believes that the prophecies, part or all, were fulfilled in 70 AD. When, if, if, I, if I know, and you can start detecting, in, even in their, their language and the way they speak, if I start detecting that, I don't put much emphasis in whatsoever in what they have to say, because it's a big deal. There's no way, now you might be able to function on a personal prophecy level where you're giving personal prophecies and believe in partial preterism, but if you are going to move into a national or an international level of personal prophecy or of uh, uh, international prophecy, and you believe in partial preterism or you believe in the seven mountain mandate, which we have on our website talked about, where you believe that the church, the main goal of the church is to conquer culture, the seven mountains of culture, and to see the nations transformed before Jesus comes back. I don't put a lot of trust in those prophetic voices. And I saw that this summer where Dana Coverstone released his dreams. And, you know, you know, not even going into whether they were right or not here, when he released those dreams, so many who believe in the Seven Mountain Mandate were, were criticizing him immediately, saying he was wrong, this can never happen. Well, what was moving them was wrong views of the end times. Their prophecy, their understanding of prophecy their understanding of eschatology was driving the way they were prophesying and driving the way they were viewing prophecy. So for me, if you believe in partial preterism or seven mountain mandate and you prophesy, to me, I don't pay much attention. One such prophetic voice even put into a book, a, a newly released book before the election that Donald Trump was going to win and he, the, that God would own the White House for the next 40 years. He got that one wrong. I would say he got that one wrong. <laughs> well, the reason he got that one wrong, his eschatology drove him to prophesy. He believes that the church, the seven mountains are going to be conquered before Jesus Christ comes back and that we're going to hand Jesus the nations at his second coming. And so your eschatology absolutely affects your prophecy. And so if someone has incorrect eschatology, I don't pay much attention to what they say. Number five, as I look for, is a prophetic voice influenced in any way by hyper grace? And, you know, we've talked about hyper grace here, this taking God's grace to an unbiblical extreme. You know, it can come across in, in ways like you don't need to repent or you don't need to ask God to forgive you or an obsession with only talking about God's goodness to the exclusion of its severity where you only talk about God's kindness and not his judgment. If someone is influenced by hyper grace, to me, I don't put a lot of emphasis on what they, what they say that God is saying. Do they preach the cross? Do they preach, do they preach not only the finished work of the cross, but do they preach our necessity to take up the cross? And I, I like what Terry Bennett said. He said, it's not, the, the problem isn't so much what they're saying, it's what they're not saying. Is you're, you're hearing in many prophetic voices, you're hearing 
the absence of the cross, the absence of the necessity for self to die, the absence of the necessity for self to be crucified with Christ. When you don't hear that, I'm telling you there's a real problem because the New Testament is filled with calls and admonitions for us to take up our cross and follow Jesus. Are prophets calling you to repentance? Are they calling you to overcome? If you don't hear Prophetic voices calling you to repent, calling you to overcome, be, stay away from them. <laughs> They're typically not speaking from God. I like what Mark Sharona wrote recently about this. He said, while Old Testament prophets called people back to the covenant with God that God made with Moses in order to bring them forward to where they were intended to be, the New Testament prophetic function calls us back to the Sermon on the Mount. That's, that, I believe that's so right. Is one of the one of the, the, the New Testament prophets call the church back to the Sermon on the Mount, to live a Sermon on the Mount lifestyle, to have the kingdom of God established fully within us. Humility, meekness, Christ-likeness, uh, enduring persecution, uh, pure eyes, uh, not, not being influenced by greed or any of that stuff. Is, is a prophet or a prophetic voice calling the church back to a Sermon on the Mount lifestyle? Number six, do they demonstrate Christ-like character? That's what I'm looking for. I want to see Christ being formed in a voice before I'll put much trust in them. Do I see humility? Do I see meekness? Do I see sacrificial love, gentleness? Do they have a care for the sheep? Do they care for God's people? You know, I think we saw in a great example of this just recently. Are they willing to acknowledge if they miss it? Are they willing to acknowledge when they miss it? I, I, I so appreciate those who have acknowledged, hey, I got, I got this wrong. Terry Bennett acknowledged that. Jeremiah Johnson, Lauren Sanford, Chris Vallotton, Sean Boltz. Those are the ones I know of who said, hey, I, I said Trump was going to be reelected. You know what? I missed it. I'm sorry. To me, what that does for me personally is it builds trust in me to listen to them that they know that they have the integrity and the character to acknowledge when they miss it. Because no New Testament prophet is infallible. There is not one that's infallible. Everyone, everyone at some point in time is going to miss it. And to, to me, for those that, that get up and say, you know, I missed it, I was wrong. To me, that shows tremendous character. Shows tremendous character. And, you know, I, I've been following some of the others that have said, well, we didn't really get it wrong. Trump's a spiritual president. Or just wait, you know, in March he's going to be reelected. Or just wait, we actually meant 2024. Or actually Donald Trump's a president in heaven and he's a legal president or whatever. And having acknowledged they miss it, to me that shows, okay, there's an incredible amount of pride and arrogance that you will not admit your faults and your, and your mistakes. Don't follow people that will not do that. that. You know, if people will not acknowledge and say, I missed it, I was wrong, forgive me, that's not someone I would listen to or follow. And I've heard some say, well, show me where, I heard this one lady, show me where in the Bible God ever told a prophet to apologize. Where did it say Elijah should, prof uh, should apologize or Daniel should apologize or Jeremiah should apologize? And I would say, uh, excuse me, but you are no Daniel, Jeremiah, or Isaiah. There are no such thing in this age, in this dispensation we live in, of biblical level prophets. All of them, because God hasn't released that measure of grace, I don't believe, in my opinion. So... To say that no biblical prophet has apologized, I would say you're no biblical prophet and you need to apologize. <laughs> so the other thing a lot of times people will do is they'll phrase their, their and be, be aware of this, is they'll phrase their prophetic words in such a way that even if it doesn't come to pass, they can't be held accountable. For example, Someone might say, well, it's God's will for Trump to be elected, but the church must pray. Well, you, I don't believe you could come back after the amount of prayer that has gone into this election. I mean, I've never seen the church in America and around the world pray more for an election. So we cannot say the church did not pray enough. 
There's no, there's no way we can use that as an excuse. I do not believe that is an accurate response. The church prayed like never before. Um, so be careful of those who use phrasing that would hold them not accountable if they miss it. Number seven is do they have an accurate track record? That's real important. I mean, you would never, no company would ever hire someone for an important job if they didn't take, look at their resume and vet their resume and say, okay, you've got qualifications here, here, and here, and I see what you've accomplished this, this, and that. No one would, would hire someone for a job, an important job, without vetting their, their resume. Why would we trust any prophetic minister that, that on their resume, they do not have a track record? Look for the track record. Look for the track record. Number eight, they have pure motives. They have pure motives. You know, some of those who are doubling down in their prophecies right now and saying, I didn't miss it, just wait, God's going to do it, God told me, and it's going to happen, you know, I don't know how, it's, you know, whatever. And they're not saying, I missed it. A lot of those have a lot at stake, and we need to know that. Some of them have published these things in books. Some of these have tremendous social media platforms. Some of these have made tremendous amounts of money from, from Trump prophecy. Some have been enriched by these things. And so it's very humble. It would be very, it's very humbling to say, I wrote this in a book, and I've been saying this for years. It's, it's humbling to say, I missed it. I missed it. Do they have pure motives? Are, are they truly prophesying so the Lord would get in a people what he's after, or are they prophesying to build a platform? See, the prophetic voices I trust have pure motives, and you can tell. You can tell. You can tell their motives are pure. You can tell that they're not doing this or saying this because they're trying to build a platform. You can tell that they really they're really doing it with a pure heart to say, I want to speak to God's people what I believe God is speaking. They're not trying to profit from their prophetic gifting. Number nine is do they carry the burden of the Lord? That's what I look for as well. The prophets I trust carry the burden of the Lord. Isaiah 13.1 says the burden of the Lord against Babylon, which Isaiah saw. Isaiah had a burden of the Lord, and that burden of the Lord moved him to prophesy, moved him to make declarations, moved him to declare. And so do they have the burden of the Lord? Do they truly want God to get what he wants? Do they, are they gripped with the lukewarmness in the church? Are they calling the church to repent? And to overcome? Do they have a fear of God? Do they realize their own accountability to speak on behalf, uh, to speak in the Lord's name? It's a serious thing to speak in God's name. A serious thing. Do they have that kind of burden, knowing their accountability to the Lord and to His people, of when they speak, that we, I got to make sure I'm really speaking what God says? Do they carry that burden? If they're just flippantly, you know, shooting out social media prophecies every day, I wouldn't trust any of those people. Just every day there's a new word. Well, I just don't think God speaks that much. Every single day there's a new prophecy. Every single day there's a new word. To me, that's almost like, okay, I don't see the burden of the Lord in that. Will they, do they have the courage to warn the church as a watchman? Do they have the courage to say, knowing like Ezekiel, if I don't declare the warning of God, the blood will be on my own hands? See, if they don't carry that burden, then I say, okay, I don't really have, I don't have a lot of trust in, in those prophetic voices. So I think, I think now, assessing the modern-day prophetic movement 
You know, I would say for me personally, there's a very small group of people that I trust that meet these qualifications. Terry Bennett would be one of them. Jeremiah Johnson would be another. I'm sure there's others, but those are the ones that, that come to my own heart and mind that I, I really trust their prophetic voices. But it, again, they, they, they apologized for missing it. Not, and, and again, not every New Testament prophet is always going to get it right. They're not infallible. Just like a teacher is not infallible. I think we should have the same way we judge prophecy is the same way we should judge teachers. I mean, why not? I mean, what's, more, what's worse to say God spoke this to me or to say this is what God's word says when it's actually taught wrong? I mean, I think both are serious. And I mean, I have certainly, as a teacher, misspoke God's word, misinterpreted God's word, and I am accountable for that. So the same standard we hold for prophets or for teachers is, the, or sorry, the same standard we hold for prophets is the standard we should hold for teachers, right? So, you know, we, we need to, everything we hear, we need to go back to the scriptures, is the, the Bereans, the Bereans is, you know, they, they, everything that the Bereans, every, everything that Paul said, they didn't just accept it as, as gospel. They went back and said, okay, do the scriptures teach this? You know, as a teacher, is what I'm teaching you, is it found in scripture? If it's not, don't believe it. If a prophetic voice stands up and says, the Lord is saying this, well, you have to go pray about it and say, is the Lord speaking this? If it's not, don't receive it. So we have a, we have a burden on us to, to test and vet prophetic words. I think what has, what has happened, I mean, this is, this is where I don't really know the answer to, but now with, with social media, with YouTube, anyone and their brother can just post out there the word of the Lord, the, the quote-unquote word of the Lord and build a following. I mean, how do you, like in a local church, it's easy to bring accountability to prophetic ministry or prophetic word that was inaccurate, it's easy to bring that kind of accountability. But in the social media, internet world we live in, it's not. I mean, so there, I mean, I think we've seen that right now, even in these Trump prophecies, is this, everything goes viral now and there's no central accountability. And so, you know, you got to learn how to test and vet the, the prophetic words you hear, um, you know, to speak thus saith the Lord and be wrong, I think is a real serious issue. It's a big deal. Um, the Lord has corrected me that over the years. I mean, when I first started, uh, I don't know, 20, 25 years ago, started prophesying, every word I got was the Lord says, the Lord says, thus saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord. The Lord corrected me on that. Be careful <laughs> saying thus says the Lord, you know, because if it's not the Lord, it's a serious deal. It's better to be a little more humble and say, I feel, I feel like God's saying or I sense God is saying than it is to say, thus saith the Lord. So when I look at the prophetic movement today, I believe what has happened is a lying spirit has entered the prophetic movement. And I said this even this summer, as I said, just looking at what's happened, I said, there is, there is a lying spirit that has entered the prophetic movement. I started noticing this years ago or several years ago, but especially now, I believe it has reached a place where it's serious. A lying spirit has entered the prophetic movement. Now, turn in your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 22. I'm definitely not going to read much out of here, but I want you to, to have this as a reference. 1 Kings 22 is, is you've seen this, it's Ahab is about to go to war and he gathers many prophets to him, the ones he likes, the ones who are always prophesying breakthrough, the ones who are always prophesying prosperity, the ones who are always prophesying this or that. And, you know, so, so, so he calls these prophets in and says, okay, what is God speaking? And one says, you're going to break through and you're going to win the battle. Another says, you're going to have prosperity and you're going to be victorious. And one after another, and that, I think that's some of even what has happened is kind of like this group dynamic. I don't want to stand alone and be the Micaiah who says something different. But Micaiah looks at them. I love Micaiah. He looks at them and he says, I see a vision. And God has sent a lying spirit to the prophets. And they are speaking falsely in the name of the Lord. 
And Micaiah tells Ahab, if you go into battle, you're going to die. Ahab listened to the false prophets, and he went into battle, and he died. I believe what we are witnessing right now in the modern-day charismatic prophetic movement is a lying spirit has entered in to many prophetic voices. And God is wanting to use this time we have experienced right now with what all has happened as a correction to the prophetic movement and, and to bring correction to the prophetic movement. And God's heart in that is that we would become a true prophetic company that speaks the pure word of the Lord, that, that preaches Jesus Christ, the testimony of Jesus, that calls the church to repentance. You know, true prophecy is so much less about predicting who wins the Super Bowl and who's the president than it is proclaiming Jesus, calling the church to repentance. And I, I believe God is going to take out of this and wanting to bring out of this a purifying of the prophetic movement. And I know Terry Bennett, one thing he said so often, and he said it years ago, and I think we're seeing it right now, is the prophetic movement as we know it is dead. I think, I think right, this was what has happened are the final nails in the coffin. The prophetic movement as we have known it is now dead. Now, that does not mean God doesn't speak, and that does not mean God does not have messengers and prophets. He does. But God is wanting to take out of this embarrassing time in the prophetic charismatic movement who's become a laughingstock to much of the non-charismatic world, a laughingstock to the world. God is wanting to use this to raise up a true prophetic movement of messengers who speak the pure word of the Lord, who are accountable for what they speak, and are accountable for what they say, and who are not just given to a people who will not vet and test their words. Part of the problem here, I mean, a part of the problem is not even these prophetic ministers. Part of the problem is the body of Christ failing to test the prophetic words. If they properly tested the prophetic words, we would not, they would not have a following. So it's not all on the false prophets or the false prophecies. A lot of it is on the prophetic church in the charismatic movement not having the courage to say, hey, this was not accurate. This was not the Lord. We need to do that. I know God's corrected me in this area. Jeremiah 5.31, I believe, describes much of the charismatic church in this, in this hour. is the prophets prophesy falsely and the priests rule on their own authority and my people love it. You touch, you start touching your prophetic idol. I'm, I'm watching this as I'm surveying all this happen. You start touching your prophetic idol who is speaking wrongly in the name of the Lord. Oh my goodness. You get backlash. You get some serious backlash. I'm just, just even in watching different people on Facebook, you know, some of these people that are, that are speaking wrongly in the name of the Lord and will not apologize, will not acknowledge they're, they're wrong, they've got uh, this a big following that are just following them as if they're just cult-like. It's just really weird. They love the false prophecy. The people love it so. And if we're going to be a people who love the truth, if we're going to be a people who love the truth, love the truth in Scripture and love the truth even in the prophetic word, then we cannot, we're not, we can't be people who are okay with a missed word. You know, I'm not saying we stone them. I'm saying we, we just, we have to test it. We have to, we have to vet it. We have to say, hey, this was not the Lord, okay? So, you know, it's the, we've got to love the truth. We've got to love the truth. We've got to love the truth. Let's, let's turn to Ephesians 2.20. I'll end with this. Is, is God is shaking the prophetic... I mean, God's shaking the whole church right now, including us. Judgment begins in the house of God. It's begun in His church. I believe that just... 
Just even, even trying to make sense of why God allowed Biden to be president. I think part of it is when Donald, when God, God supernaturally, by the way, if you don't know this, God supernaturally put Donald Trump into office in 2016. There's no way he would have gotten in without a supernatural intervention from God, in my opinion. And the Lord did it, and my, this is what I believe, in my opinion. Uh, I believe it's the Lord. But I believe the Lord, his ultimate aim in putting, there's, there's many purposes God used him for, but one of the ultimate things for the church was that Donald Trump would be a reprieve against the push for globalism, trying to create a one world government, so the church would have more time to make herself ready. It was a, a reprieve so that we would be ready. And, and that's one of the reasons why the Lord called us during that time to two years of intense preparation to be made ready. I don't believe much of the church, I don't say this pridefully in any way, um, but I believe much of the church in America did not discern God giving us a reprieve through Donald Trump for the bride to be made ready. And instead, much of the church began to look to Donald Trump as a political messiah, as a political savior who would save America. Look, I'm all for, I, I would love to not have what, who we have in office right now. But I think what happened is the church began, instead of saying, okay, God's given us time to make ourselves ready, the, the church began to look at it to say, God wants to make America great again. You see what I'm saying? And I think we missed it. I don't think God ever put Donald Trump into office to make America great again, even though that was the campaign he was running under. And I, I'm all for America becoming a, a good again. Um, but I just don't think God's intention, God's aim in that was to make America great. God's aim was to give the church more time to make herself ready. And therefore, it's almost like God was saying, well, uh, we can do it the easy way or we can do it the hard way. The easy way is I'll put Donald Trump into office in 2016 and you under a time of peace and prosperity can use the reprieve and make yourself ready. Well, few really did that. So now the Lord is like, okay, now I am going to do it the hard way. I'm going to do like it is in Isaiah chapter 10. I'm going to bring an evil government upon you, upon my people in this nation to make you ready. And then once the judgment or once the sin has matured and is ripe for judgment and the preparation has been done in God's people, then I'm going to flip the head and bring judgment on the evil government. That's what I believe. That's what I believe God is doing through all of this. And so um, I guess the, the, you know, God is calling us back. God is calling the church back. The true prophetic voice is calling the church back to himself. Make yourselves ready. Ephesians 2.20 is, is a very important thing. The church of Jesus Christ is built upon Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone, the Old Testament prophets and, and their revelation, and the New Testament apostles and, and what they brought. The New Testament church is built upon the prophets, apostles, and Jesus Christ. As I think in this time, the Lord does not want us to build our lives upon modern day prophetic words, though we need them. Remember, don't despise prophecy. The Lord wants to bring us back to what the prophets and the apostles and Jesus have said. That should be the foundation we build our lives on. And so as we close, as God is doing a, a refining work in the prophetic movement, as, as we close, I believe God is saying to the church, build on the right foundation. Amen.